So for a final point in this lecture, I'm going to just discuss briefly how we measure performance of one of these microprocessors. So I want to say that there are two main kind of metrics that we should look at. One is response time, which means how long does it take to do a task? What is the latency of a task? I run an instruction or I run a program, how long will it take to complete? But that's not always the most important thing. Often, the more important one is the throughput. That's the total work done per unit time. How many tasks or transactions or whatever are finished per hour or per minute or per second? Um, and that's often more important than how long it takes to do one single task. However, right now, we're just going to focus on the first one, which is response time. So let's define that performance equals 1 divided by execution time. And when we discuss elapsed time, we have to look at two different factors. One is the total response time. That includes all aspects of the execution, including the processing, of course, the I.O. operations, the OS overhead, the idle time. All of these things are kind of overhead that we may not take into account when we're measuring our CPU. On the other hand, the CPU time is just the time that's spent processing a given job. And this really gives a big discount to things like I.O. time and the share of the other jobs in the whole um, pipeline. Okay, so... Um, in this, in this case, we're just going to discuss CPU time because I.O. and other things are really system dependent and we have to take them into account in regards to the whole system and not just looking at the microprocessor. So how are we going to increase performance? Well, let's look what CPU time is made up of. So CPU time is made up of the number of clock cycles times the time of one clock cycle. That makes up the total CPU time. So how are we going to make this better? On the one hand, we're going to try to take fewer clock cycles. On the other hand, we're going to um, try to reduce the clock cycle time or increase, increase the frequency of the clock. So let's look at both of those. CPU clock cycles, what is it? It's actually the number of instructions, our instruction count, times the cycles per instruction. Okay, This is also known as CPI, and the reciprocal of it is IPC. Okay, So how are we going to make that better? Fewer instructions reduces the instruction count, and fewer cycles per instruction um, will, will, in, will uh, reduce the CPI. And both of those will reduce the number of clock cycles and therefore reduce the total CPU time. When we look at instruction count, what is that? Well, instruction count isn't so straightforward. It's really determined by the program, by the ISA, and by the compiler. All three of those are very different. Different programs will have different number of instructions, of course. Different ISAs, like if it's a CISC, it may have fewer instructions than a RISC. And the compiler, if it's better at optimizing things, may be able to reduce our instruction count. It also depends on what the um, objectives, uh, the, what the targets of the compiler are. And what about average CPI? Well, that's really determined by the CPU hardware, how many cycles it takes to carry out one instruction. But the average CPI can be really affected by the instruction mix, which again, depends on the program, depends on the compiler, and so forth. Um, so to in total, CPU time can be shown as instruction count times CPI divided by clock rate. This leads us to the basic iron law, which is how we can figure out CPU time. So CPU time, according to the iron law and according to what we wrote before, it's the number of instructions it takes to run a program. That's our instruction count. Times the number of clock cycles per instructions. That's our CPI. Times the number of seconds per clock cycle. That is our frequency, right? So we have instructions per program times clock cycles per instruction times second per clock cycle. And that is the iron law of performance. So what does performance depend on? It depends on a lot of things. It depends on the algorithm. The algorithm affects the instruction count. Okay, The algorithm may, infect, may, may affect the cycles per instruction because the algorithm will affect the mix of the type of instructions we use. How about the programming language? Well, that for sure affects the instruction count. And again, the CPI. Again, because depending on how we wrote the program, it will affect how our uh, algorithm is implemented. The compiler, well, the better the compiler is, or the higher target it is at lowering um, instruction count, it will probably get us a reduced instruction count. And the same thing with clocks per instruction. If the compiler is better and knows how to optimize this, it can take that into account and try to arrive at a smaller CPI. And what about the ISA itself? Well, the ISA itself, of course, affects things like the instruction count. If we have a six versus a risk, for example, 
the clocks per instruction. So again, uh, usually a risk will have fewer uh, clocks per instruction than a CISC machine. And the cycle time itself, because as I mentioned before, we can usually um, implement a risk machine at a much faster frequency than we can a CISC machine, even though, of course, Intel has been working very hard for the last uh, number of decades to, uh, to make that not really happen. And that brings us to Amdahl's law. And Gene Amdahl was a true pioneer of computing, one of the best known computer architects there was. And he put forth a law, something that's actually well known. And he said that really the way you can improve a system is actually to work on, you only can improve it by the point that you work on. And so we get the time that it takes to run a uh, computer uh, process. It is, it is actually the part that we didn't actually work on plus the part that we worked on divided by the improvement factor. A corollary of that is that we should make the common case fast. So if we look at this kind of an equation here, we see that we only affect one part of the system. Okay, we Only the part that we worked on and made better is affected. The part that we didn't work on, it's completely unaffected and gets unchanged in, in, in total. And therefore, we should try to have the part that is affected be the common case. And when we say common in this context, we mean the most time consuming, not necessarily the most frequent. For example, let's say that we're doing a lot of additions. We're doing, you know, 10,000 additions. And then for every 10,000 additions, we do one memory access. But let's say the memory access takes a million cycles, whereas a, a single addition takes one cycle. Therefore, the more that we go and work on the most frequent part, which is the addition, it barely helps because we're really dominated by those memory accesses. So we should work on improving the memory access, and maybe only slightly improving the memory access will give us a much better total improvement to our time. Okay, so really we should work on the most common case. Make the common case fast. But notice that the uncommon case, where, while it doesn't make much difference at the beginning, when we go and work on the common case, sometimes we make the uncommon case become the common case. And this can happen um, back and forth. And so we are actually usually working on different parts of the entire um, process. But we should really put most of our efforts at what is the most common case right now. Let's give an example um, of Amdahl's law. So let's again take something like a uh, processor with memory. And looking at this, um, this uh, processor that we just uh, made up, we have memory operations that are taking 30% of the total execution time. And we'll add something called a cache, which we'll discuss later. But you guys probably already know that a cache is some sort of memory structure that enables us to make our memory faster. And what it does is it takes 80% of the memory operations and speeds them up by 4x. That's quite a speed up. On, on memory operations, a 4x speed up, that should really reduce our um, cycle time and give us a speed up. So let's see how that comes out using Amdahl's law. So let's look at the overall um, breakdown of how our, uh, how our cycle time is made up. And we see that the, si the memory is made up of 30% of the execution time, while other operations are 70%. And out of that, we're actually only affecting 24% of the uh, total uh, execution, which is 80% of the memory operations. So this part of memory operations, we're not able to affect it. So let's see how this is sped up. What we're going to do again is take this L1 cache part, and we're going to reduce it by 4x, which gives us you know 6% of the total time. So we, um, we reduced this to 6%, and now we have 6%, 6%, and 70%. So our, time is, is, uh, our total time is now only 82% of the original total time. If we put it in um, in Amdahl's law equation, we have the unaffected part, 0.7, plus you know, um, uh, out of the 30% of the total time, 80% of those are going to be sped up by 4, and 20% of those are going to be unaffected. And that comes out, as in our picture over here, to be 0.82. And 1 divided by that means we get a speed up of 1.22x. So really, um, this amazing speed up that we applied to our memory, it gave us, uh, it gave us quite an overall speed up, 22%, but only 22% for a 4x speed up of, of this what we would con uh, consider a pretty critical part. And that's because it only actually is, accounts for 30% of the execution time, while 70% is something completely different. And because we weren't able to affect the 6%, 6% it's actually 70%, 6, 76% we weren't able to touch at all. How about we add an L2 cache now? We're going to take the, the remaining half uh, 
the, the remaining um, uh, NA over here, and we're going to um, speed it up by a factor, speed up half of it by a factor of two. So let's see how that's going to affect us. And we'll um, put it in our equation over here. So again, we have this 0.7, we have this 0.3 times 0.8 divided by four, and now we take half of the remaining part and we're gonna speed it up by two, and that brings us to 0.775. Wow, okay, we got another um, quite a speed up. Well, actually, be careful there because I made a mistake in my calculation. That wasn't enough. We forgot the part of the, um, the L2 cache that it doesn't affect this NA area. So we see here that out of the total 6% of the memory operations that we didn't touch before, half of them, which is 3%, we still weren't affecting. We only doubled the speed of half of them, so that was reduced to 1.5%. And so that gives us an 80.5% uh, out of 100% we had before. Or if we put it in our, in our same equation, what we forgot over here was the 0.5 times the 6% of the memories that were not affected. And that leaves us with a 1.24x speed up and not the 1.29%. But see, we only jumped from 1.22x to 1.24x, which is uh, substantial, but it's a small speed up. And that is because all we worked on was really this 6% even less, only on the 3% of the memory accesses or 3% of the cycle time that, or, or that was over there. So a last note is um, something called MIPS. And MIPS is millions of instructions per second. And this is one of many different commonly um, used uh, figures of merit to show how fast the CPU is going to be. So I just want to go over you uh, with you what MIPS is. MIPS is the instruction count divided by the execution time um, and uh, factored into millions. So it's the number of millions of instructions we do per second. And we uh, remember that execution time is actually instruction count divided times CPI divided by clock rate. So if we replace it with that and then we can factor out these two and move that up, we get clock rate divided by CPI times 1 million. Okay, so MIPS is a commonly used uh, way to compare different machines, but it doesn't account for everything. There are differences in ISAs between computers which are not taken into account here. Instruction count will be much lower, for example, for a CISC machine versus a RISC machine, okay? And it doesn't take into account the different in complexity between instructions. So different types of programs uh, um, and different instructions will run differently, and it only takes into account here really the instruction count. Um, in addition, CPI varies between programs on a, on, on a given CPU, so it really depends on what kind of uh, a program we're running and how it was compiled into what instructions it will change the average CPI. So there's not even a single MIPS number for a given computer. And the reason I'm showing you this is because uh, you may see MIPS or other figures of merit used to compare between different machines. You may see something about the new AMD versus, uh, versus Intel CPU saying this one is better than that and another report saying that one's better than this using some figure of merit. And MIPS is an example of this. We see it doesn't account for everything. And you have to take that into account. For some things, these are very good for comparing. For other things, it's kind of cherry picking and things are not carved in stone. So you want to make sure that your figures of merit cover what you actually want to compare and, uh, and show that you're better or worse than something else for the, uh, the right reasons. So that's the end of our lecture about microprocessors. And here are some of the real main references that are used. Um, and we'll continue next time with um, more interesting things that you wanted to know about a computer.